thanks Joseph, uh, thanks uh, Claire and Jalil for the invitation. So I was supposed to tell you about online decision making uh, with randomization and I will still do that. But since there is a, a diversity of background and interest in the room, I thought that instead of focusing on the problems, I'm going to focus on the tools and the solutions that we have to those problems. Okay? So the focus is going to be on a certain algorithm, which is called mirror descent. And I'm going to tell you about this algorithm and all kinds of nice properties of it. And then as an illustration, I will use it to solve many different problems in uh, randomized online decision making. So the new title of the uh, mini course is uh, the five miracles of mirror descent. Okay, and uh, the five miracles are going to be the following: uh, robustness, uh, potential based. Tracking, I will explain all of those things. A certain type of information geometry. And finally, adaptivity. So again, I will, so basically each day I'm going to cover one of those uh, miracles and some application uh, of it. And again, I want to emphasize that, so mirror descent is a variance of gradient descent. And my expectation in that, you know, in the years and decades to come, this will be used for many for more things than it has been used for so far. So I believe that it can be used to prove, in fact, many theorems in, in pure mass, for example. And there are some examples of it so far, but not that many. So I hope for the, this audience, if I tell you about all of this, you can use it and, and then prove cool uh, new things. It's also very useful in applied mathematics as an actual algorithm, and, and we'll see how and why. OK, good. So let's start with the first chapter. So chapter one, the original miracles. Or the origin miracles. OK, good. So. First, I'm going to do like maybe half hour of slightly boring uh, reminders on convex geometry. OK, so I will try to go fast, but I want to make sure that we are all on the same page. And then after these uh, brief reminders of convex geometry, I will tell you about gradient descent and just the basic analysis of gradient descent. And we'll see some foreshadowing of some of those miracles in this case. OK, so that's the plan for the first hour. So one uh, brief reminders of convex geometry, of convexity, let's say. OK, so this will be extremely simple things. Really nothing deep there, but uh, it will be useful throughout the entire course. So I want to make sure we all have the same uh, background. OK, so let f uh, be a convex function. OK, so what does it mean? It just means that it's uh, above any of its tangent. OK, so for any uh, x, y in its domain of definition, we have the following inequality. Uh, f of y is bigger than uh, f of x plus grad f of x uh, inner product with y minus x. OK, so this is the linear function, which is tangent at the function uh, at x. And what I'm saying is that this is a uniform lower bound on the function f everywhere. And I'm going to call the discrepancy between those two terms, between the left hand side and the right hand side, this is called the Bregman divergence of the function f. Okay, so the difference, so uh, left hand side minus right hand side, is by definition the Bregman divergence between y and x. So this is called, this thing is called Bregman divergence. OK, and this will be a, a very, very central object. And it's just uh, this difference. OK? So in just roughly, you know, if y and x are close to each other, you should think that this is of order of the Hessian, maybe 1 half of the Hessian of phi at some point uh, z, but let's call it at x. Uh, applied to y minus x, y minus x. 
Okay, so when I use this notation, I just mean, you know, in, in matrix notation, it's y minus x transpose this matrix uh, inner product with y minus x. Okay, or applied to y minus x. Yeah? Phi is f. Say again? Phi is f. Phi is f. I'm going to only have Bregman divergence of phi's. That's why I. <laughs> sorry about that. Yes. Please uh, ask me as many questions as possible. The more questions, uh, the better. Okay, so let's start with a very simple uh, lemma about optimality of, uh, I mean, first order optimality for constrained optimization. So let me also let k be a convex set. Okay, so I'm going to write y is uh, the argmin of f of x subject to x is in k. Okay, so let's say I want, I want to have first order optimality condition for this constrained optimization problem. Okay, so minimizing a convex function subject to convex constraint. So I claim that this is equivalent to uh, the negative gradient. So if I didn't have the constraint, right, this would be equivalent to uh, the gradient is equal to zero, right? That's the usual thing because for convex function, local uh, minima are global uh, minima. But with the constraint, we have the condition that the negative gradient is in the normal cone at this point. So this is in the normal cone at the point y. Okay, and what is this definition? This object, the normal cone, is just the following thing. It's a set of direction theta in Rn. Okay, n is always going to denote the, the ambient dimension. It's a set of direction theta which are negatively correlated with any direction going inside the body. Okay, so all the theta such that for any y, for any x in k, the inner product of theta with uh, x minus y is negative. Okay. This is the definition of the normal cone. So in terms of, of picture, if I have uh, something like, like this, this is my convex body k. And let's say I'm at this point uh, y, this is y. Then the normal cone is the following object. I have uh, 90 degrees here, 90 degrees here, and it's all of this. All of these directions, you see they are negatively correlated with any direction going inside. If I go inside, you know, if I go like this, I have inner product zero with this one. And with any of these, I have an inner product which is negative. Okay, and the same from the other direction. So this is the definition of the, of the normal cone. So we're, we're going to see exactly what is a normal cone in the case of a polytope. That will be very useful. Uh, so we're, we're going to do that in a minute. But first, let me prove this. So the proof is very simple and tells you exactly what's going on. So say that minus grad, fe, grad f of y is not in the normal cone. OK, so if it's not in the normal cone, then uh, by definition, there exists a direction which is positively correlated with the negative gradient. So there exists a direction inside k positively correlated with um, the negative gradient. So if I do a little step in that direction, I'm going to decrease the value of the function, okay? Because I go in the minus grad f uh, direction, okay? So that means, and I stay within k because that's the definition of the normal cone. So that means that y cannot be a local minimum. So y is not a local min. A local, hence global because it's convex, minimum. Okay, so this is a, a very, very simple proof. Okay. So th this uh, will be very useful. Uh, another thing which is going to be useful is to understand what the normal cone looks like.
So the second lemma, lemma two, I didn't put numbers. So this was lemma one up there. So lemma two, let's say that K is a polytope, so it's of, of the form uh, all the X such that for any J in one through M, we have the linear inequality AJ in a product with X is less than BJ. Okay, so you just have a, a, a bunch of uh, half intersection of uh, half spaces. Okay, so, so this is the definition of the polytope. Then the normal cone at some point x, this is just the conic combination of all the tight constraints. Okay, so it's a set of uh, sum of lambda j a j over all the j such that a j dot x is equal to b j. And the lambda j are non-negative for any j in one theorem. Okay, so in this picture, you see, I had at the point y, I had two tight constraints, right? This one and that one. They have two normal directions. And my cone, my normal cone, is just all the positive combination of those two normal directions. Okay, that's all this is uh, saying. So let's, let's prove this just to, you know, so you guys warm up and I warm up. Uh, so let's let's prove this. So let's do the first uh, inclusion. So the fact that this set is included in that one. Okay, so that's really easy. Um, so what do I need to do? I need to show that any of those vectors is negatively correlated with any direction going inside the body. Okay, so let's look at such a vector, sum of lambda j, a j, and take a direction going inside the body. So I'm at a point x, and I go to some point y. So I have y minus x. OK, I want to show that this is negative. I know the inner product of x dot aj, because this is the sum of all j, such that aj dot x is equal to bj. So this is equal to the sum of a j of lambda j aj dot y minus bj. OK? But the lambda j's are non-negative, and a j dot y minus b j is negative. B j is a scalar. There is it's like this. Parenthesis. Thanks. Yes. So a j dot y minus b j. Okay, this thing is negative or non-positive, and this is non-negative. So this is uh, non-positive. Okay, so this vector, this vector is in the normal cone. Now, let's do the other direction. Okay, so I want to show that this thing is included in that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a point which is not in this set, and I'm going to show it's not in that set. So let theta be some point which is not in the uh, conical of the tight constraint. OK. Uh, what am I going to do with this theta? So the picture, again, is like, like this. OK, and I have some theta here. So. I have a theta which is not in a convex set. So the things that I can do is that I can separate those two things. Okay, so I can find a linear function whose value at theta is, say, 1, and whose value here is less than 1. Okay, so I'm going to find this. So there exists w such that uh, w dot theta is, say, 1, and w dot uh, sum of lambda j a j is always less than 1, right? But in, in fact, so w, so this means uh, w is uh, positively correlated with theta. And this doesn't mean it's negatively correlated. But in fact, it does mean it's negatively correlated, because this is a cone, OK? So if there was a point, a value of lambda for which is strictly positive, I can just you know, 
multiply this by a very large number and get anything bigger than one. So in fact, in fact, less than one must be less than zero. Okay. So W is negatively correlated with any of the AJ. Okay. So W is negatively correlated with any tight AJ. So what does it mean? It means that I can do a small step in the direction W. I do a small step in the direction W, and I remain in this, you know, I, I still satisfy all the constraints. Because at the tight constraint, I only improve, you know, I only make this thing a bit smaller. And for the other one, because there was some space, I'm not going to satisfy any of them. So I can do a little step in the direction W. But this little step is positively correlated with theta. So theta is positively correlated with a direction going inside the body. OK, so let me just say this again, just to conclude. OK, so uh, let me see. So what do I? So this part implies that x plus epsilon w remains in k. And but with this, that means that you know if I combine both of them, I get that uh, w epsilon w uh, is inside is direction inside k and positively correlated with theta. So theta is not in the normal cone at x. Okay, so I show that any point which is not in this is not in that, so I get the inclusion that I wanted. Okay, and now I will just give you a last lemma, and then this will be it for the uh, very brief uh, reminder. So lemma three. So lemma three is uh, is the following. Mm. Let's say y is the projection, the Euclidean projection, onto k of some x. Okay, so this by this I just mean the arg mean of uh, you know the norm uh, of uh, let's say. Z minus X, the Euclidean norm over Z in K. Okay, so I have a point X and I just project it on my convex set. Then I claim the following. So Y is certainly closer, um, how to put this? So I have X, I have K. And I project, and now what I'm going to say is that y is closer to all the points in k compared to x. Then y is closer than x to any point in k. Again, this will be, all of those things are going to be very, very important. So if you want, if I want to get closer to some point that I don't know in k, if I project, I manage to do that. I always improve my distance to any point inside. Okay. So the proof is uh, it's just an application of the first lemma. So apply lemma one to the following function, uh, f of z, which is, let's say, one half of the norm of z minus x squared. Okay, so again, the definition of y is that it's a minimizer of this function. Okay, so by lemma one, I know that the negative gradient, negative gradient is in the normal cone, so I know that the gradient is positively correlated with any direction inside. Okay, so what is the gradient of f of z? 
the gradient of f of z is just uh, z minus x. Okay? And by lemma 1, I get that y minus x, so this is the gradient at opt, is positively correlated with any direction inside. So a direction going inside, let's say I, I'm going toward the point z. Uh, so I'm going toward the point z from y, so z minus y. This is non-negative for any z in k. Okay, so this is what lemma 1 gives me, that the gradient of this function is positively correlated with any direction going inside. Okay, maybe I should just draw a picture to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, you know, this is x, I project, I get y here, and I have some other point z here. And what I want to say is that this distance is smaller than that distance. Okay. Okay, so I have this inner product. So now let's see what, uh, what this implies in, in terms of the distances. So let's look at the distance x minus z squared. Okay, this is what I want to show is bigger than y minus z. So I'm just going to expand the square. So I get that this is x minus y norm squared plus norm of y minus z squared plus twice the inner product, uh, which is x minus y inner product with y minus z. Uh, which is exactly this, with a minus and minus sign. Okay, so I get that this is non-negative, this is non-negative, so this is bigger than norm of x minus y squared. Okay? Okay, that's all I wanted to tell you for the reminders of convexity. I think this is all I'm going to use. Okay, at some point I will talk about financial duality, but uh, uh, okay, I will very briefly say what it is. But this is basically all you need to know about convexity. Is there any question on what we did so far? Okay, so now let's move on to the real uh, topic which is this algorithm mirror descent. And again, it's a more elaborate version of gradient descent. So first I need to tell you about gradient descent. Okay. So two uh, gradient descent. So gradient descent is just an algorithm to, uh, it's a procedure, an iterative procedure to optimize a convex function. Okay, and it takes the following form. The iterate at time t plus one, it's the iterate at time t minus some learning rate eta times the gradient of f at x t. Okay, you just have the direction in which you can decrease the function and you take a little step in that direction. That's, uh, that's what gradient descent is. So, okay, uh, let's analyze it. Let's try to analyze uh, its rate of convergence. So we have the following picture. This is xt, and this is x star, which is, let's say, the minimum of f. Okay, and let's say right now we're talking about unconstrained minimization. There is no, there is no constraint. So if we knew x star, we would just go from xt to x star, okay? We would go in that direction. But instead, here what we do is we calculate the negative gradient, and we take a little step and we move here. This is xt plus 1. Okay? But what do we know by convexity? Convexity tells us that this direction is positively correlated with that direction. And how much of a positive correlation? Exactly the gap in function value. Okay, so what am I saying again? I'm saying the following. Um, maybe view it like this. f of x t minus f of x star. 
this is smaller than grad f of xt in a product with xt minus x star. OK? So the negative gradient is positively correlated with the direction x star minus xt. OK? So again, minus grad f of xt is uh, positively correlated with xt. Uh, x star minus xt. Okay, so I'm going in the right direction. All right, and and there is some distance that is shrinking, and the distance should be shrinking by something like this value. Okay, so this is how you do the analysis. The analysis is you just set up a potential, which is your distance squared to the optimum, and you write down what is a decrease in, in terms of this potential in terms of this inner product, which you relate to the suboptimality gap. OK, so let's do that right now. So I just need the following thing. Um, this is some vector A. And let me see. What do I want? Uh, let me see what's the nicest way to put it. Yeah. This is some vector B. OK, so B is the step that I'm taking. A is the optimal direction. Those things are positively correlated. And this is my new direction, A minus B. A minus B plus B is A. OK, good. So uh, what do I want to know? I want to know how does the potential shrink. So I want to know the norm of A squared minus the norm of A minus B squared. OK, so what is this? Well, there is twice the inner product, A dot B. So this is the correlation, correlation drop. OK, so uh, if a and B are positively correlated, and this dist distance shrinks by that amount. And then I have a remainder term, which is minus uh, the norm of B squared. OK, so this is some kind of error term. OK, and think that B is going to be eta times the gradient. OK, it's going to be a step size times the gradient. So this is of order eta squared, whereas this is of order eta. So if I make my step size smaller and smaller, the second order term gets smaller and smaller. Okay? And what I'm going to do eventually in the, in the uh, second hour when I tell you about mirror descent, because things are a bit more complicated for mirror descent, I'm going to take eta all the way to 0. So I'm going to look at the continuous time equation. Okay? So the continuous time equation will be something like, so this, this is related to the gradient flow. Uh, so d over dt of x of t is minus grad f of, f of x of t. Okay, so we're not going to do that right now. Right now we stay in discrete time, but next hour we go in continuous time, and the continuous time will make these error terms disappear. Okay, I'm going to explain all of this, but it's just to, to give you a feel for where we're going. Right now we're in discrete time. OK, so equipped with this uh, identity, let's analyze gradient descent. OK, so gradient descent analysis. OK, uh, so all I want to know is this. I want, let me set up so we are good, x star minus xt squared minus x star minus xt plus 1 squared. OK, so this is exactly this picture, right? This, this was x star, this is xt, this is xt plus 1. So this is a and uh, this is a minus b. This is equal to twice, OK, the inner product of a, which was x star minus xt, with the negative gradient, so minus 2 eta inner product of this with grad f of xt. And I have a second order term, which is minus uh, eta squared times the norm of the gradient 
of f of x t. OK, I have those two, those two terms. As I told you, this correlation, I can, uh, so you know, with the minus sign, I can, I can, let me see, I want to say it's a drop by that much, so I want to upper bound it. Uh, and I, why can't I upper bound it? X star minus xt with a minus. Ah, uh, no, I want to lower bound it, sorry. I want to say this drop is big. I want to say I drop a lot. I shrink a lot my potential. Okay, so I want to lower bound this. So this is lower bounded, okay, by 2 eta times f of xt minus f of x star. And this term, let's say, you know, to simplify for the moment, let's just say that all the norm of the gradients are bounded by some L, which means that f is L Lipschitz. So this is uh, lower bounded by minus eta squared L squared. Okay, so, so this is f convex and L Lipschitz. Okay, but now if I rearrange, I can sum over those terms. You see, this, this, this term is summable. So what I do is I just sum over all time step. Let's say I run for t time step. I get the following. I get the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of f of x t minus f of x star. This thing is upper bounded by, okay, I get the sum of those things. Uh, the last term is certainly non-negative, so I can just keep the first term. I get the norm of x star minus x1 squared over eta plus eta t l squared. Okay, so, okay, so this is just the, the two line of equation gives us this result. Okay, the so sum of the Suboptimality gap is upper bounded by the distance at, uh, at the starting point over the learning rate plus the learning rate times t l squared. Okay. So if I optimize over eta, I get the geometric mean of those two quantities. And what I can say is that suddenly I visited a point whose value is smaller than the average of those values. Yes? Yes, let's uh, get the twos uh, correct. Uh, there is a two here, and there is a two here. Yeah, thanks, that will be useful. How can you choose eta in advance if you don't know x star? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, for instance, if you do constraint minimization, which we're not doing right now, but if, we, if you did do constraint minimization, then you know that, you know, the distance to opt is at most the radius of the of the set. Okay. If it's a bounded set, then you know a distance. Otherwise, uh, yes, you you cannot. Yeah. But more questions? Yes. Yes, that's true. Uh, so we're going to mostly care about uh, constrained optimization, and then, you know, everything is fine. Um, but yes, this is an assumption, and if, if you have more, you know, if you know that, for instance, your function is quadratic, then there is many more things that you can do, okay? This course is not, let me say it right away, this course is not about optimization per se, okay? The course is about an algorithm, a framework, which is this mirror descent framework, which comes from this optimization perspective, but I'm not going to use it to tell you about convex optimization. I'm going to use it to tell you about decision making and how, you know, potentially it could be used for other things. Uh, we will, from time to time, mention things about convex optimization like we're doing right now, but it's not the main objective. Okay, so the theorem just that we get, so the theorem is that uh, there exists, so with uh, optimal eta, let's say, 
And you know, again, we can discuss how to get this optimal letter, but this is just to give an order of, uh, you know, of the things. So with optimal eta, there exists a time t in 1 through capital T, such that the value that you've seen is close to the optimal value, up to what? So again, I said that when you optimize, you get the geometric mean of those two quantities, and there exists a point t which is smaller than the average. So the geometric mean is going to be this without the square times L, uh, times square root t. So when you divide by t, you get 1 over square root t. Okay, so you get the norm of x star minus x1 uh, times L over square root t. With, without a 2, because uh, without a 2 or with a 2, uh, you get when you optimize, uh, each term is going to be the geometric mean. So you sum both of them. So there is no 2 anymore. Yes? So can you explain why you have a big T extension? Yes. So all I'm saying is that this thing is smaller than 1 over capital T, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T. I don't know that. I didn't say that. I say there exists a time. Not, I, I didn't say this happens at the final time. Uh, big T can be anything. So as big T goes to infinity, this is going to 0. Right, so eventually you get close to zero, but I'm not saying that this bound holds for the last term. I'm saying it holds somewhere in the run of the algorithm. There is an averaging that's happening here. Yeah. Is there more questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know where it is. Oh, it's here. Okay, I think the question is. Uh, you, can you get this with capital T? Isn't it true that f of xt is decreasing so that the last one is the smallest? Yeah, so that is not true because if you have a function like this, you know, you're here, you can overshoot and get here. So it's not, it's not decreasing along the path. Was, was that the question? Okay, yes. So it's not true. You know, for instance, here you could keep, you know, bouncing back and forth. But the point is then the, there is a, yeah. Anyway, I, I don't want to get into more details of this. Uh, in fact, I'm going to argue in a, in a minute that this is the thing that we're going to want to look at. Okay, not, not things like that. This is what you care about in optimization, and this is what we're going to care about in, uh, in online decision making. All right. Okay, so now, right, so the uh, So first, uh, mini miracle. Okay, this doesn't. Uh, it's not included in the five miracles. Is that constraints do not matter? It's kind of a, a very nice thing because you know constraint optimization is very difficult and complicated in general. But gradient descent just doesn't care at all. So what do I mean? If you just do xt plus 1, you know when you do xt minus eta grad f of xt, this can step outside of your set of constraints. You know, maybe you, you just uh, step outside. So let's just project back. Let's just look at the projection of this thing. And what I claim is that because of lemma 3, which was that when you project, you just cl get closer to every point, the exact same analysis still hold. Okay, so by lemma 3, 
the same analysis holds. Why is that? It's because my potential is this you know, distance to opt. But opt is some point in my convex body. So when I project, I just get closer to that point. I just improve my potential. Projection can only make things better. Which makes sense. I'm kind of, you know, I'm giving you more information about where opt is. Okay, when I refer, so x star, I'm, I'm always going to refer it as opt. When, if you have more information about opt and you, you know, include those, this information into your algorithm, it kind of makes sense that it only improves things. Okay, so that's, that's quite nice. Uh, okay, but that's, that's just a mini miracle. I mean, it's going to be very useful. So now a real miracle. Um, first miracle. Robustness. OK. So let's say that you cannot exactly compute the gradient. For instance, uh, you only get the gradient with noise. Then I claim that, again, the exact same analysis holds. You don't need to modify anything. So let's see that. So say we do a step with some vector gt in Rn uh, instead of grad f of xt. OK, you step with some other vector which is not the gradient of a convex function. It's some, some vector. Then what did we actually prove? OK, we proved, if we exactly look at our analysis, we proved the following. In fact, we proved an equality. We proved that the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of gt inner product with xt minus some x star, whatever is x star, OK? x star doesn't have to be, maybe there is not even a convex function. We're going to get to that. but. This is equal, we proved that an equality, to uh, x star minus x1 squared minus x star minus xt plus 1 squared over 2 eta plus eta over 2, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of the norm of gt squared. This is what we proved. OK. Yes? Inequality, right? uh, so it's an inequality if you have projection. But without projection, it's an equality. If you look here, this was an equality. Right? The only inequality was when I wanted to lower bound by the suboptimality gap or if I use uh, the projection. OK. So, so, so I wanted to, you know, Eventually, we only care about inequalities, but I wanted to clarify that we didn't lose anything here. Um, so we're going to look, I mean, during the week, we're going to look a lot at expressions of this form. Okay, so I want to take a minute to, to, to stare at it. So really, the interpretation of this is, is going to be, this is a, a range. This is a range term. Okay, the size of the set over which you're optimizing, your distance to opt at the beginning. And this is a variance term. This is kind of, this comes from the errors that maybe you're stepping a little bit too far. And you see that as you take your step size eta smaller, the variance term gets smaller. You make less and less error. You, you overshoot less and less. But the, the size of your set gets bigger and bigger in a sense, okay? because it's going to take longer and longer to reach opt. Okay, so this is. Also, one way to see this is that this is a term which corresponds to forgetting the initial condition. Okay, it's the same, same thing, okay? It's just uh, more words to say the range. Okay, it's, this is how long it's going to take you to forget where you started from. Okay, so we're going to play a lot with those two terms. But now let's, say, let's see what happens. Um, if gt, again, I said, if it's the gradient of f of xt plus some noise. OK, so consider, 
So this is called in the literature stochastic gradient descent. So GT, uh, let's say GT is such that it's a random variable. And it's such that the expectation of GT conditionally on the past, OK, so everything that you have observed up to time t, let's say that this expectation is the gradient of f of xt. OK, so you observe the gradient plus some noise. OK, so you're not stepping in the right direction. You're stepping in some random direction, which is, in expectation, the correct direction. Well, then you can just take the expectation here. And the left hand side will become in expectation grad f of xt in a product with xt minus x star. And on the right hand side, the only thing which is random is this thing. So instead of the Lipschitz constant, you will have the second moment of your noise term. OK, so let me say again the theorem is that in this case, we, we get exactly the same thing. We get that the expectation of f of xt for some t minus f of x star. Uh, this is smaller. Uh, let me see what do I want to say. This is smaller than uh, norm of x star minus x1 times b over square t, where b is, let's say, the max over t of the expectation of the L2 norm of gt. Okay, it's some kind of, it's the second moment of your noise. And we really didn't do anything. I mean, the algorithm just does it for you. You don't have to change anything. It's, it's very nice. Yeah. Uh, so again, like all of those little things, you know, there is an entire field that grew out of those observations, and we're not going to cover it. So, so the field that grew out of this is called the stochastic approximation, and the seminal paper is uh, Robbins Monroe uh, 51. Okay, which basically observed this. But now I'm going to make another observation, which is more recent. But mathematically, uh, nothing, literally nothing happens, but, but conceptually something happens. So this is Zinkevich uh, 2003. So the observation is that you can be robust even to adversarial noise, or even to noise which is you know, biased, non-zero in expectation. So imagine that you have these you know, uh, random gradients, which are correct in expectation. And then in addition, there is maybe an epsilon fraction of the steps, which is corrupted arbitrarily. So say, uh, I don't know if you can read here. So say epsilon fraction of the steps are corrupted. By that, I mean just gt is, is some arbitrary vector bounded. gt is some uh, arbitrary bounded vector. OK, so in general, I mean, it's not easy in general to come up with robust algorithms, right? Here, I could, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, I from time to time, I, or maybe for so either from time to time, I give you a very wrong direction, which takes you in the opposite direction. Or maybe at the beginning, I you know, mislead you completely and tell you, OK, you should go over there. And then you go you know, at, at the wrong place, and you start from very far. The point is that no matter what you do, you cannot really mess up with gradient descent. Gradient descent is automatically robust. And you see it from this identity. Like, if an epsilon fraction of those things are wrong, OK, it doesn't matter. You know, this is just going to be an epsilon term. So what you get is you get the same statement. So you get this bound plus epsilon. 
and that's it. Okay, you don't, uh, it's just completely robust. You cannot mess with it. And that's, that's going to be very, very important for, for the rest of the lectures. Now, the way, the modern way to phrase all of this is through what's called the regret. And the regret is basically this notion, uh, except that, as I said, you don't even need to have a fixed function behind. I mean, those GT can be literally anything. Okay, so the modern notion that we're going to uh, partially study, we're not going to only do that, but we're going to look at that, is a regret. And the regret, there, there is many ways to motivate it, but given what I have done so far, one way to motivate it is that it just unifies everything I told you so far. Out of it falls all of these little applications. But, but in fact, it does more, and we're going to see more eventually. So the regret. Regret against, uh, say, f1 up to ft, sequence of convex functions. So you can think of it as these are convex functions uh, that you don't know in advance, and you discover them iteratively. So you, take a, a de you make a decision, you choose a point xt, and then you evaluate it on ft. Then you move on to the next function, and so on and so forth, and you compare yourself to the best you could have done in hindsight. So the regret is the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of ft of xt minus ft of some x star. Okay, so again, you choose xt without knowing ft. Once you have chosen your point, then the function ft is revealed. In fact, for the gradient descent algorithm, you don't even need to know the entire function, you just need to know the gradient. Okay, so you have to make those decisions under uncertainty. You're taking your decision of what to play xt without knowing what is going to be ft. But the, the saving grace is that you compare yourself to a fixed point in hindsight. Okay, this is what allows you to, to have non-trivial guarantees. And what we proved is that this, you can get a 1 over square root t uh, guarantee. Okay. So what we're going to do uh, next, I will just show you very briefly uh, that these things are, are optimal. This 1 over square root t rate is optimal. And yeah, and then uh, I will dwell a bit more on, th on this. Wh what, what does it mean? I mean, how is it that we can compete with something which is changing over time? We're going to talk about prediction with expert advice. And then hopefully I'm going to be able to define mirror descent. And, uh, and, and that will be it for today. OK, so now we take a break. Is that the? Yes. Cool. So do we have any more questions? On supposed to take this okay um, very simple so here the assumption is that ft for every t has a minimum that this is this x star no um, no so these fts they could have completely different minimums what I'm saying is that I'm comparing to some fixed point x star so you can think that xr is the minimum of the sum of the functions, the sum of the ft. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, it's the average which is smaller than. Well. Sorry, uh, could you repeat the result in the 2003, the last line? Of yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wasn't very precise uh, a little bit on purpose, but the, uh, the, result, the result is really this one. Okay, the result is really like this. So you have this sequence of convex function, which you do not know in advance. And now you're playing a game where at every time step you select a point in Rn, and you evaluated the, the loss that you suffer is this convex function, which you do not know, at this point. 
Then, once you have suffered this loss, you observe the convex function. You see, ah, you know, if I were there, I would have been better. That's the framework. And what we just did, if you think about it, the analysis of gradient distance that we just did shows to you that you can have a regret, which is like 1 over square root t, uh, by just running gradient descent. Because you know, gt is just going to be grad f of, x, of ft at xt. Okay, so that's the Zinkevich observation, which, which is a, a change. It's a, it's a philosophical change. You see, it's a, you know, now you don't have a fixed convex function. Functions are changing over time. Yeah? Sorry. Uh, is x star really fixed or it's actually with an index t? Because, like, no, yes, uh, okay. it's fixed. So here, x star is really fixed. It's and and in fact, I should when I we're gonna drop the uh, uh, the notation x star because it's confusing. We're just gonna call it y. Y is some fixed point that you're comparing to. It doesn't have to be the optimum of anything. Okay, if you want to compare to the best fixed point, I mean to the best point for each time step, we're also gonna talk about that. So this is gonna be one of the like a uh, central application of everything that I'm telling you about, I can just give you the name now, which is called metrical task systems, which are exactly problems like this, where you want to compare to something that change over time. So this has a long history going back to 20, 30 years ago, and it's all gonna be solved very simply and elegantly through the mirror descent framework. So, so we're gonna get to that, but right now there is just a fixed point. It's not changing over time. Basically, the tracking miracle is going to be that this guy can also change over time, but we'll get to that. <laughs>